Good morning, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this, the 23rd meeting of the Standards Procedure and Public Appointments Committee in 2024. Um, I have received apologies this morning, unfortunately, from Ruth Maguire, but we are joined by Rona Mackay, MSP, as substitute to this committee. Good morning. Um, Rona, do you have any declarations of interest that you would like to note? No declarations, thank you. Excellent, thank you, and welcome to today's proceedings. Today, the committee is looking at stage two of the Scottish Elections Representation and Reform Bill. And before I start, I wanted to briefly explain the procedure we'll be adopting during today's committee. Members should have with them a copy of the bill, the marshalled list, and the groupings. These documents are available on the bill web page of the Scottish Parliament's website for anyone who is observing. I will call each amendment individually in the order of the marshalled list. The member who lodged the amendment should either move it or say not moved when it is called. If that member doesn't move it, any other member present may do so. The groupings of amendments sets out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. In each debate, I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in the group to speak to and move that amendment and to speak to all of the other amendments in the group. I will then call other members with amendments in the group to speak to but not to move their amendments and to speak to the other amendments in the group if they so wish. I will then call any other members present who wish to speak in the debate. Members wishing to speak should indicate that by catching either myself or my clerk's attention. I will then call on the Minister if he has not already spoken in the debate. And finally, I will call the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up and to indicate whether he or she wishes to press the amendment or indeed withdraw it. If the amendment is pressed, I will put the question on the amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw an amendment after it has been moved and debated, I will ask whether any member present objects. If there is an objection, I will immediately put the question on the amendment. Later amendments in a group are not debated again when they are reached. If they are moved, I will put the question on them straight away. If there is a division, only the committee members are entitled to vote, and voting is by a show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands raised clearly until the clerk has recorded their names, and if there is a tie, I will exercise a casting vote. My policy will be to use my casting vote against any amendment. The committee is also required to consider and decide on each section, and indeed the schedule of the bill and the long title, and I will put the question on each of these provisions at the appropriate time. I am not now going to open that up for questions. I am, however, going to um, commence and I'm going to call the first grouping of amendments and I'm going to call Amendment 57, that is in the name of Ross Greer, that's grouped with Amendment 68. Ross Greer to move Amendment 57 and speak to both amendments in the group. Ross. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, it might seem a little bit odd in the first instance that um, I, as a Greenham, uh, moving a, an amendment to get rid of cash deposits now that we are finally at the stage of uh, other parties that we can, frankly, afford to pay these deposits ourselves. Um, but I'm moving it because I really don't believe that participation in elections should face financial barriers, and cash deposits obviously create that. Your ability to pay the £500 bears no relation to demonstrating a reasonable level of support. Uh, deposits actually originated as a way to pay for elections. Post-World War I, uh, the political parties themselves combined had to pay for the administration of elections. Clearly, we've moved well beyond that. So they are a legacy of a, a different era of electoral administration. The Electoral Commission have reviewed this a couple of times. So when they reviewed it in most recently 2015, um, most of the countries that they reviewed had no cash deposit system, certainly across Europe. So Germany, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands uh, don't have such a system. Uh, the United States has quite complicated ballot access arrangements, but it doesn't have a, a cash deposit system. And those that did tended to have uh, deposits, uh, financial deposits, far less uh, than the equivalent of £500. Pounds. So the argument that's used now for them, given that we've moved beyond the point where they're used to literally pay for the administration of elections, um, is that 
they provide a, a, a barrier to filter out unserious candidates. They limit our ballot papers compared to, say, in Australia, where ballot papers can reach a, a metre and a half, two metres long, with over 100 candidates on them for, for some Senate elections. But the length of our regional list ballots for the Scottish Parliament would suggest that they uh, are not exactly acting as a significant disincentive in, in that manner. Plenty of quote-unquote unserious candidates can afford £500, but that financial barrier uh, does get in the way of perhaps what you might regard as more serious candidates, particularly independents. So what I'm proposing instead is uh, that we uh, strengthen the system, the equivalent system, to, to what's part of the Westminster general election nomination uh, process of the, the nominator or subscriber system. That actually long predates cash deposits. We've had that system in place for Westminster candidacy since uh, the, the 1870s. Uh, you only currently need 10, of course, uh, but that's combined alongside the, the £500 cash deposit. Um, for some reason that I've not quite been able to get to the, the bottom to uh, the bottom of. Uh, we replicated the requirement for a cash deposit for uh, Holyrood uh, constituencies, uh, but we didn't uh, replicate the uh, 10 nominations threshold for Holyrood when, when this place was established. So the Electoral Commission's 2015 uh, report, I'm going to just read the conclusion of that out into the record, because in moving this amendment, I want to emphasise that uh, this is simply about implementing a long-held recommendation of the Commission, where they state quite clearly, we recommend removing the requirement to pay a deposit at all elections, as we do not consider that there should be a financial barrier to standing for election. So what I've proposed instead is that nomination threshold. So for constituencies, it would be 0.05% uh, or 50 um, individuals. And the reason I've uh, proposed that is, in practice, in most mainland constituencies, uh, that would be 50, not 0.05% would be usually slightly more than, than 50 uh, people for a, a mainland constituency. Uh, but the reason I've included the 0.05% is to reflect the fact that island constituencies have much lower populations, and I feel it would therefore be reasonable uh, to have a lower nomination <laughs> threshold in an island constituency. And then again, for the, the lists, it's 150 or 0.05. So generally, that's going to be a, a 150, of course. Um, I have included provision for, for ministers to vary uh, that in future uh, to reflect uh, population change uh, and I would propose that deposits are still allowed in the event of snap elections recognising the fact that clearly it is going to take a bit more time to collect signatures than it does uh, to simply uh, lay a, a cash deposit. Um, I've also included a provision that if a party elects anyone, uh, then they would get automatic ballot access at the subsequent election. Again, that's quite common across uh, other systems comparable to our own, because the fact that you've demonstrated somebody previously is clearly a demonstration of your credibility and a reasonable level of, of public support. Therefore, uh, why should any barrier be placed in the way uh, of you doing so? So, for example, all of our parties would have to go through this nomination process once, but assuming that at least one MSP from each of our five parties is returned at the 2026 election, we would not have to do so again in 2031. Uh, for me, I think for the five existing uh, Holyrood parties in particular, it ends what, frankly, I see as just a total inefficiency of hundreds of thousands of pounds being transferred from all of our bank accounts at the start of an election period to a council bank account and then transferred back into the party accounts afterwards, assuming we, we reach 5% in, in all the relevant locations. So that's um, 57. You'll be delighted to know that uh, I don't have nearly as extensive a set of speaking uh, notes for all of my subsequent um, amendments, but these two are the most substantive, I would say. Apologies, Ross. Can I just intervene at that moment just for a point of clarification? You said with regard to... Um, 579A1. I think you spoke about 0.05% in your debate, but actually the amendment talks about 0.01%. I think the figure is the same, 50 voters. I just think for the record it is 0.01% for the constituency. Yeah, ap apologies, uh, yes. convener. I uh, was reading from the, the wrong uh, number at that point. Um, so, yes, the constituency, sorry, 0.01%, is 0.05% for the, the regional list. Sorry, I should have made that clear. Um, on uh, 68, the by-elections um, amendment, um, this, I feel, is, is designed to address what I see as democratic distortion 
caused by having single member by elections for multi member wards. Again, might look a little bit odd coming from a Green, given that as of this year we have finally started winning some by elections ourselves. Um, but I do think that distortion argument is an important one to, to air in Parliament. So, for example, uh, Perth City North at the moment has uh, three SNP councillors in a three member ward as a result of a by election. Uh, despite the SNP having substantial support, but less than 50% support, and strong support in that ward for both Labour and, and the Conservatives. Uh, Drumchapel uh, Annie's Land had uh, four out of four councillors from the Labour Party uh, after uh, our colleague Bill Kidd stood down from his council seat to, to focus on uh, this place. Hell Head in Glasgow, if there was another by-election there, if Councillor Ken Andrew, and I emphasise that I don't believe he's going to, but if Councillor Ken Andrew were to decide to move on and do something else with his life, uh, the Greens would win that, and we would have three out of the three councillors in a ward that we only elected one out of the three uh, at the last election. Parliament made the choice to adopt STV, to adopt a proportional uh, system for council elections. Other countries that use STV for their local elections generally don't have by-elections. So in the Republic of Ireland, for example, uh, they don't have by-elections. Northern Ireland, of course, doesn't as well, but that's for very different reasons about maintaining balance between communities. So I generally don't use that one as, as an example. But the Republic of Ireland doesn't. They have a similar system to what I'm proposing here, uh, which is if a vacating councillor was originally elected on a party ticket, that party's nominating officer uh, would be able to appoint a replacement for them. I would propose maintaining a by-election system for independents. Um, that doesn't go as far as other systems. So in Ireland, for example, if an independent councillor vacates, uh, it's up to the council to decide how to appoint their replacement. I wouldn't quite go that far. I think it's reasonable to have by-elections in the case of independents. And yes. I'm, li I'm listening very carefully to this. Um, now, having been a councillor who was elected under STV, you can correct me if I've got you wrong here, but what STV does, I'm a big fan of STV, because what it does is if you're elected under STV, people have had to actually vote for you individually, rather than uh, those of us who are elected under the list system, yourself included, myself included, nobody voted for me personally to get me into this place. But as a councillor, people had to vote for you. So if you want to get re-elected, you have to work your socks off uh, and prove to people that you deserve their vote. So the STV system, and similarly, um, if there's a by-election, establishes a link between... It's not the party, it's the individual. The individual and the electors. By not having a by-election, you get rid of that. You almost go back to... Uh, the party list system, which puts the power in the hands of parties, and that seems to me to be entirely wrong. Yeah. Ross, uh, thanks, Commissioner, and, and, and thanks to, to Mr Simpson for that. Actually, it takes me on to exactly the point that I wanted to close on, uh, because I will absolutely concede that there is a, a trade-off here. Um, individual uh, candidacy does matter more in a local election than, than any other level. Um, it often doesn't matter quite as much as I think those of us who are candidates and elected representatives would like to think of, of ourselves. Um, but it does matter, and it absolutely matters more at a local election. So there, there is a trade-off here. But the point I would make is, at the moment, many people who uh, vote to elect councillors of the party that didn't come first in a multi-member ward, which is usually most uh, people, uh, are then left without representation as a result of a by-election caused by the vacancy for any candidate other than the one who came first. So um, I don't have uh, a comprehensive uh, recall of the... Yes. It's okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I don't... I think Mr Greer's touched on this already, but is there also a consideration to keep in mind of the inconvenience and public cost of multiple by-elections following uh, the main local authority elections, which are you know, cyclical, um, next one scheduled for 2027? Absolutely. I think there's, there is an interesting point for us to, to consider there. So the, the cost of administering a by-election uh, exceeds the annual salary of uh, a local councillor. Uh, so the, there is a, a cost-benefit analysis to be, to be made uh, on that point. Um, now, with apologies to Mr Simpson, because I can't remember exactly the, the results in his ward at, at most local authority elections, but if, if I recall correctly, if he were, for whatever reason, to have vacated his ward uh, mid-session... I don't think it's particularly likely that his party would have won the by-election. 
Um, but that would have left those who had originally voted Conservative without the representation uh, that they had asked for. Uh, in, indeed, because uh, Ms Webber is reminding us that actually uh, her party probably would win a by-election in, in her former council ward. Uh, but the point stands that in general, you know, the examples that I mentioned, Perth City North at the moment, there have been examples in Dundee. This was very regularly an occurrence in Glasgow for some years. Uh, the Hill Head Ward that my party won at a recent by-election, if we were to win another by-election there, we'd have three out of three councillors in a ward that originally elected one Green, one SNP, one Labour. Um, so I don't believe Parliament has ever debated this issue before. So I've moved this amendment because I want to, to air the issue. If there is an appetite for exploring this further, my intention would be to come back at stage three with a more uh, detailed amendment. Uh, frankly, I didn't want to have the legislation team in Parliament put an extensive amount of work into an issue if there was no appetite for it across Parliament. But I want to explore the issue at this stage and ascertain whether there is that appetite to explore this further. Thanks, Convener. I'm grateful to Ross Greer. Any other members? Joe Fitzpatrick. Just uh, ve very briefly, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Ross's second point, um, you know, um, in spite of the fact that we've just won a by-election in, in Dundee, which gives us three out of four in the seats in, in, in the Lochie Ward. But, but this would be a significant change, and I don't see how we can make a change at this stage, prior to stage three, with, and, and be able to have the relevant um, discussions with local government colleagues in particular, um, who might feel this is... Um, the Parliament doing to them rather than engaging with them. So I, I think it's good that this has been aired, but I would hope that you won't take it to stage three because I think it's something that would take a, need a bit more discussion with our local government colleagues. Thank you. Annie Wells. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Convener. And whilst I, I can understand Mr Greer's intentions with the amendments, I do feel a bit like my colleague Joe Fitzpatrick has said that we probably do need a wee bit more... Um, dialogue about this and a wider discussion on it. So at this moment in time, we can't, I can't support these, these amendments, but I think it's an interesting idea and I think we should have a wider discussion on it. Thank you, Convener. Minister, can I come to you? Thank you, Convener. Can I first of all say I'm very grateful to Ross Greer for having uh, taken time to discuss these amendments with me in advance of today's uh, proceedings. I very much uh, appreciate the points that Mr Greer has made which include that requiring candidate deposits could be viewed as a barrier to engagement in the democratic process. I understand the points he makes. There is a, a reasonable case to be made for requiring candidates to have demonstrated some support in the process of being nominated in the local area that they're seeking to be a candidate, and also that by-elections can impact the proportionality of council representation. I understand the points he has made, and there is some merit in the case for these uh, changes. However, by my estimation, uh, convener, removing deposits and doing away with local government by-elections represent fairly significant uh, changes. Uh, I should say, I know Councillor Ken Andrew very well. I'll certainly be pressing upon him not to stand down in the Hillhead uh, ward. I am also taken uh, with the point that Graham Simpson has made, and I do think there is a, a balance here, but equally when we are ordinarily voting along party lines at a council election. You are also uh, electing an individual. So I do think, uh, whilst there is merit in uh, the arguments, I do think they require uh, some further thought. These are pretty big changes. They've not been uh, subject to uh, consultation as part of the process for uh, this bill. Uh, I take the point that uh, Mr Greer has made there was uh, work by uh, the Electoral Commission. Uh, I would observe that was some time ago. Uh, there were not issues, as far as I'm aware, it can be not raised uh, at stage uh, one. Uh, the Electoral Management Board convener has raised some concerns uh, around these changes in his letter uh, to uh, the committee. Uh, I also think, and again I recognise there is a case and it does ape the, the uh, elements of some uh, systems in other jurisdictions, but I think in particular the difference in threshold for uh, those parties who have had electoral success and those who have not uh, in terms of uh, requiring uh, to collect signatures. I think that would uh, in particular require some uh, consideration. I would also say there are, are some drafting issues that might require attention if uh, these amendments were to be uh, successful today. Of course, we could uh, deal with that at stage uh, three. What I should say, I do think uh, the issues that have been aired are worthy of uh, future consideration. They, they could and it probably should be uh, debated and discussed 
by Parliament at some point in the future. However, for me to introduce them into this bill at stage two is probably not the best uh, way to make such major change the way we carry out our election. So on that basis, I would urge the committee not to uh, support uh, these amendments. Uh, in doing so, I would refer uh, members of the committee to the letter I have uh, sent regarding the consultation the Scottish Government is committed to on other areas, uh, which we will turn to later in uh, the uh, debate on other uh, groups of amendments. If this is an area of interest to the committee, I am more uh, than willing uh, to consider how we might be able to undertake a similar exercise in this area of election law too. So I thank Mr Greer for bringing forward uh, these uh, amendments. Uh, I think it uh, is worthwhile uh, airing uh, these issues, but I would ask him uh, to consider not pressing them uh, today, but should he choose to do so, I would ask members to vote against them. Okay. Uh, come to Ross Greer to wind up, press or withdraw Amendment 57. Thank, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thanks, Convener, and thanks to the committee members and, and to the Minister for taking part in the debate. I, I recognise that these are significant um, changes. Um, I do think we should be a bit cautious about the argument that significant changes cannot be introduced to bills through amendments because that uh, robs everyone other than uh, the government of the ability to make significant change. And of course, uh, backbench MSPs from the governing party as well as opposition MSPs also have the right to, to legislate for substantive things. Though, yes. I suppose the point I, I was trying to make, convener, and I think this is a strength in our process of deliberation. Clearly, there's a stage one process. If these issues had been uh, considered in detail by the committee, and of course, I recognise it's for the committee to uh, consider what it wants to determine at that stage. But if it had uh, been aired at that stage and there had been uh, recommendations, then I think we can demonstrate across the range of amendments I'm bringing forward today that we uh, listen to what the committee has said and the balance of the evidence it's gathered, and we will respond with the appropriate amendments. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a fair point from the Minister. My counter to that, though, um, is that I, in all honesty, as much as I think this bill is full of a whole range of reasonable suggestions, I think in many uh, cases it is a missed opportunity. There was an opportunity for the government to uh, consult much more widely on opportunities for democratic reform to coincide with the 25th anniversary of this parliament. Uh, and I do feel that there is a missed opportunity there. Um, and I, but I acknowledge the, the points that the, the minister has made. Um, and if I can draw out from what he was saying around uh, the commitments made elsewhere for consultation and his offer to the committee to consult on this as well, uh, I'm perfectly happy to, to take up that offer because I do acknowledge that these are significant change. Uh, I do believe that uh, consultation uh, would be helpful on them. In bringing these amendments, I wanted to um, provoke to, to kickstart that debate. Uh, so I am perfectly happy to withdraw on the understanding that uh, the government will take these forward as part of any future consultation uh, that also draws in other areas that uh, we're going to come to later on in proceedings. Um, Ross Gray seeks to withdraw Amendment 57. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? No, no the amendment is withdrawn. Um, the question is that sections 1 and 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Grateful. I'm now going to call the next section, Amendment 8, in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 8 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Convener. Convener, this is the uh, largest group we will discuss today, uh, and it's an important one where we'll be discussing disqualification from elected office. So uh, I... Uh, Forgive me, Convener, this will be uh, uh, one where I uh, take some time to discuss the amendments tabled in uh, this uh, group. Uh, I'll start with the amendments in my name, which would bar persons subject to sex offender notification requirements or a sexual harm or risk order from holding office or standing for election as councillors or members of this parliament. As the committee is aware, persons serving a sentence of over 12 months are already barred from being an MSP for the duration of their time in custody, and a person sentenced to three months or more are prohibited from being councillors for five years. I will hope, uh, convener, that the committee will agree that we've had a, a good deal of constructive debate on this issue. My predecessor wrote to the committee on the 2nd of February to highlight the government consultation last year in barring sex offenders from being uh, councillors. He explained that it seemed logical to apply uh, also apply any prohibition to members of the Scottish Parliament, but before bringing forward provisions, the Government wished to take the views of the committee 
and others. We have since discussed a, a number of, port, of important aspects. This has include, included comparisons within the UK and elsewhere. And I thank you again, Convener, for highlighting the work of the Council of Europe's Venice Commission on Exclusion of Offenders from Parliament. Uh, we have discussed the rationale for a change in the law. I consider that there are two aspects here. Uh, the first is protection of the public in face-to-face -face encounters with an elected representative. The second is an overall case that allowing an acknowledged sex offender to serve in office risks undermining public confidence in our democracy. Uh, these factors and our consideration of the matters associated with the Venice Commission have informed the approach taken in these amendments. We have looked at a range of notifications and orders in relation to sexual offending and have sought to apply disqualification where there would be concern about a person subject to these measures holding office. This includes cases where a requirement is imposed in the context of conviction, but also cases where an order is imposed by court on a civil basis. These amendments ensure that the package of reforms are both robust and fair. No serving representatives subject to relevant restriction when the requirement to take effect will be removed from office when the provisions take effect, although they will be barred from standing again for as long as the restriction applies. This future cases only provision is the normal safeguard adopted in making changes of this nature. And I know we will turn to Annie Wells's amendments in a few moments, which touch on that area. Uh, we have also made provision to ensure uh, that people with a pending appeal uh, get the opportunity for their case to be heard. They will be suspended prior to the determination of uh, an appeal. Uh, and there is a three-month maximum period after which disqualification will apply if the appeal remains pending. I think this is the sensible and proportionate uh, approach. Convener, in relation to other amendments uh, in my name, I am also amending the bill, bill's provisions on disqualification orders and in relation to intimidation. If while those provisions took appeals into account in the same way as planned for sex offenders, the bill only suspended MSPs but not councillors during any appeal period. Convener, you will recall that when I was at the committee before, I think uh, an important part of our approach here should be equivalence, broad equivalence, where we can achieve it between the approach we take between uh, MSPs and councillors. And that's what I seek uh, to do here. Amendment 17 rectifies that point so that councillors with a pending appeal are also suspended in the same manner as those appealing against other disqualifications. Uh, having mentioned them, let me now turn to uh, the amendments in the name of Annie Wells, which seek to disqualify all people who have ever been subject to a relevant restriction or order. I am grateful to her uh, for taking, uh, having taken the time to already discuss these amendments uh, with me. Uh, these amendments, I believe, would raise uh, significant concerns uh, around ECHR uh, compliance. I also consider it to be extremely difficult to enforce and obtaining information on historic uh, requirements and orders, particularly those from out with Scotland, would be extremely challenging. I would also highlight that her consequential amendments 20A and 20B are unnecessary unless amendments 9A and 9B were to be agreed. If there is support for amendments 9A and 9B, we might want to consider carefully what references to historic restrictions are needed on any transitional <coughs> provisions. Uh, I would therefore uh, urge, uh, the, given these uh, concerns, serious concerns, concerns convener, the committee not to support <coughs> these amendments. Uh, I will now turn to the other non-government amendments in this group. Uh, convener, I think there is uh, merit in addressing the issue of dual mandates, or what are called dual mandates, in relation to the Scottish Parliament. But much as with the points I made in the last group, uh, this should be done through discussion and consultation and not through this bill at stage two without that detailed process of consultation having taken place. I have already written to the committee to make uh, that uh, point. Uh, there are policy issues with Graeme Simpson amendments, which I have been able to discuss. Uh, with him, I am, of course, grateful to him as well for having taken the time to do so, particularly in relation to the position of individuals elected only have around a year left in their councillor role before the next local government elections are held. It would have implications for the public purse if significant numbers of local by-elections were to occur after each Scottish Parliament election. Given that the ordinary local elections take place the following year, those elected at those by-elections would only have the roles 
for a few months. There will also be a period with the council seat vacant for up to three months before a by-election would be held. The experience in Wales is such that they have built in a period accommodating any imminent council election within the time frame in which a councillor is elected as a member of the Senate has to make a decision about which office to retain. This is the type of issue I believe that would benefit from further consultation. So I would urge uh, Mr Simpson not to press amendments, but if he does, I ask committee members to vote against them. Uh, amendment 58 uh, from Mr Goodell, which uh, again I have been able to discuss uh, with him, and again I am grateful for that opportunity, it goes further than Mr Simpson in relation to peers in that it does not allow them to take a leave of absence as an alternative. They must resign from the Lords once and for all in order to take their place as an MSP. Another issue that has not been subject to any debate or consultation before today. I should say my own personal perspective in relation to the House of Lords. The easiest way, of course, to achieve this would be the abolition of the House of Lords, but that is, of course, with our uh, ability. And I should say, uh, to be consistent with uh, my concerns about the need uh, for consultation, I think uh, that point uh, lands uh, here as well. So I would urge Mr Greer not to press his amendment, and if he does, again, ask committee members to vote against it. Uh, all of this uh, suggests to me uh, that a proper consultation process is required to allow the full range of policy options to be considered before legislating pro to prohibit dual mandates. And you will have seen that from my recent letter to the committee. Uh, in light of the clear interest uh, there is in exploring matters, uh, I think it is an issue. Of course I will. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention uh, and of course we, as he said, we've, we've discussed this uh, and uh, he, he copied me uh, into the, the letter that he sent to the committee. Um, I just wonder if the, the Minister could say um, if he is going to launch this consultation on dual mandates, when that, when that consultation might be launched? In terms of when it would be launched, um, I'll give the the age-old answer, as soon as possible. I think the point I would make is uh, the commitment would be to have the consultation in this parliamentary session and to conclude uh, the consultation in this parliamentary session. Uh, having made the commitment to uh, consult, uh, given uh, these issues have been raised and raised earnestly, uh, I think it is important that I make that commitment and we would honour uh, that commitment, uh, Mr uh, Simpson. So I am uh, genuinely committed to consulting on uh, these issues, so we can gather uh, views on uh, the matter, and as I say, we'll ensure uh, the consultation takes place in this parliamentary session. I would therefore urge uh, the committee to vote against uh, the various amendments that I have uh, spoken to, other than my own, uh, I should uh, make mention of, uh, and allow full and proper consultation to take place uh, before Parliament as a whole uh, can take a position on dual mandates. I am uh, grateful to Ben McPherson also for having taken the time to speak to me regarding uh, his Amendment 59. Uh, whilst there may be a, a case for an MSP to be required to be ordinarily resident in uh, Scotland, uh, again, this is an amendment that has not had any prior debate or discussion or been raised at stage one. Uh, this may well be another area worthy of future consultation, but there are important issues to consider, not least whether there would be or should be uh, a transitional provision to prevent potentially disqualifying currently serving MSPs, for example, if someone happened to reside just over the border. And I would urge, uh, in the first instance, uh, Mr McPherson not to move his amendment, if he so does, uh, the committee members to not uh, support it. Ross Greer's remaining uh, amendments in this group cover disqualification orders under the Bill and the Elections Act 2022. These are the orders that we are looking to put in place which seek of our people from office when convicted of a crime involving hostility toward elected representatives, campaigners and electoral uh, workers. Uh, Mr Greer's suggestion that any offence involving abuse in an electoral context should carry a sentencing aggravation is an interesting one. Uh, we already provide additional protection for certain groups, such as emergency workers, by setting out sentencing aggravations. And it's true uh, that concerns have increased in recent years over abuse towards uh, elected representatives and election workers. That concern is why the disqualification measures in this bill have been developed. But I am uh, concerned that adding a sentencing aggravation at the, this stage has not been fully 
considered. There has not been any consultation on such a step, which could, for example, uh, look at how a new aggravation would sit with other statutory aggravations. On Amendment 61, uh, Mr Greer has touched on a question that we've discussed before at this committee, and that is the checking of uh, candidate eligibility, which is simply not a feature of our system. Returning officers in particular do not check if candidates are disqualified, and the committee heard evidence at stage one about the resource implications if such a system were to be introduced. 2,548 candidates were nominated in the last local government elections. In 2017, 2,572 candidates were nominated. At the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, 357 candidates were nominated for constituencies, and in 2016, the equivalent number was 313. I would be very reluctant to try and set up a screening process without evidence that there is a problem of disqualified people standing for office. I will take uh, Mr Greer's intervention, but I think I was about to uh, go on to the point. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Thanks, Minister. I expect the Minister was about to go on to this point because it is one that we have discussed. But given that he has mentioned the, the number of candidates who stood for election, I would emphasise that um, <clears throat> any system that maintains a list of disqualified individuals uh, surely would um, involve a mechanism where you check the list of disqualified individuals, not the, the list of candidates. And unless there is an explosion of the kind of issues that uh, would result in somebody being disqualified, the list of disqualified individuals is always going to be far smaller than the 2,500 people uh, who stand for uh, election at a, a local authority. So all a returning officer would have to do is to cross-check the list of disqualified individuals. Uh, there would be no point in the system where anyone has to actually check all 2,500 candidates. It's checking one list against another rather than the other way around. So I'd want to emphasise that as much as the Minister is factually correct to <coughs> point out to the number of people who stand for election, that would bear no relation to the workload involved in checking who's disqualified or not. Well, that actually wasn't the point I was going to come to, but I do take that point. I suppose the point I would make is that goes back to what I'm trying to touch on, that this starts to open up the notion that there is a requirement for uh, returning officers, for those involved in the process of uh, accepting and processing nominations, to then have to start taking uh, that step beyond the uh, checks that they would otherwise uh, take. I think I'm right in recalling that uh, the evidence that has been provided to the committee thus far is that the system we have in operation right now, by and large, operates effectively. There hasn't been any form of substantial concern uh, in that basis. So. It isn't um, so much, and actually the point I was going to make is that, strictly speaking, Mr Greer's amendment does not in of itself uh, set out to create a, a, a full screening process, uh, including even in the limited circumstances he has uh, required. Uh, but I do fear that it starts to move us in that direction, uh, convener. And I guess uh, the point there would be you know, it's not clear why we would pick out just this one aspect of eligibility for the Electoral Management Board to uh, collate uh, data on. And I am concerned that Amendment 61 would send uh, a signal to a move towards, uh, if not a full vetting system of nominations, although it could send that signal, uh, a, a wider uh, vetting system of nominations with huge uh, logistical uh, consequences. And I would also note that the convener of the Electoral Management Board wrote to the committee yesterday to say that this represented a significant change in both policy and practice, and his estimation is that it should be subject to further consultation. So on that basis, I would urge the committee eh, not to support Amendment 61, but I do look forward to eh, the debate that we'll have on this group of amendments, and eh, with that, can we then move Amendment 8? In my name. I'm very grateful, Minister. And just before I move on, can I clarify in your evidence you talked about an Amendment 9B. I am assuming you were making reference to Amendment 20B, as we don't have an Amendment 9B in our marshalled list. Um, um, yes, sir. Uh, that is what I, I you intended. That to. was a slip of the tongue. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Annie Wells, to move Amendment 8A and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, convener. And on, of, on the outset, I'd just like to thank the minister for his constructive discussions with regards to these amendments. Um, 
But whilst the Minister's Amendments 8 and 9 do prohibit individuals who are currently on the Sex Offenders Register, my um, Amendments 80, 9A, 20A and 20B go a bit further than that. And it prevents all sex offenders, including those who have been on the Sex Offenders Register, uh, um, from standing at the Scottish Parliament or local elections. And my, my, sort of, my reason for putting the amendments in was people I've spoken to say they simply wouldn't feel comfortable allowing someone who had committed a sexual offence um, to stand for this parliament or as a councillor, um, just because simply a period of time had went by that they have been removed from, from that register. And Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can we, I, I think we would all recognise and understand and appreciate uh, that uh, point, and um, uh, that, that would be an understandable human instinct. I, I would wonder, though, if Ms Wells has reflected on the fact that we have had to very carefully consider uh, the balance between uh, ensuring that those concerns that people would reasonably have, and indeed that's why we've brought forward these provisions in the first place, uh, along with making sure that we're the right side of uh, the requirements that have been laid out with uh, the Vienna uh, commi uh, Commission, uh, which I wonder if she's th thought through how consistent it might be to go that uh, bit further. I am uh, genuinely concerned about it. To put it in uh, context, you know, we had to give very, well, of course, we give very close and careful consideration to anything we bring forward in uh, uh, law. It can be about in this area. Uh, you know, the one stage there was a sense, you know, could we even go as far as we could for parliamentarians because the Commission, the person who I think we've landed with the appropriate uh, balance, uh, I'm just concerned, and of course, you know, it would be the government would have to defend and robustly defend any legislation uh, subsequent to it being passed, becoming an act of uh, Parliament, and I want to make sure that we have uh, as robust a set of legislation as we can. So. Whilst I take on board the concerns that Ms Wells has, and that's the very reason we brought forward these provisions, I just wonder if she's reflected on whether or not uh, the step that she is asking the committee to take strikes the right balance and might just be a step too far. I thank the Minister for um, his intervention, but after meeting with the Minister, I do recognise that my amendments probably um, don't meet Article uh, Protocol 1, Article 3 of the, the European Convention on Human Rights. And at this minute in time, I think that I put the amendments in rather hurriedly um, last week um, because I wanted to have this discussion on them. But I would be happily not press the amendments today, but maybe have further discussions with the Minister as to what else can we do to just to instill public confidence, I think, um, in, in what we are trying to achieve here. Um, and I'll now move to my colleagues' amendments one, two, and Could three. I quickly yeah, come and ask you absolutely. A on the previous amendment, because yeah. I think obviously we took evidence from, from the uh, police last week, and I, I guess one of the things, just to clarify, in terms of your contribution so far, was the police were clear that there wasn't a register as such, there wasn't a list, and the R in SONR is is somebody who's subject to requirements, so it's not a register, it's not a list. So actually, one of the things we were asking the police about last week was about the ability for them to um, in, enforce and, and to be part of the process to make sure that any law around this area was actually practical and, and could be enforced. And what the minister is suggesting, the police were comfortable that they and other MAPA partners would be able to comply. Mm -hmm. What you're suggesting goes further because, there's, as, as the police said, there's not a list, there's not a register, and you'd be asking us, asking someone, the police potentially, to take actions on people who are no longer under the sex offender notification register yeah. Yeah, and requirements. Th thank you, Convener, and, and thanks, to, thanks to my colleague, um, Joe Fitzpatrick, on that. My, my intentions with this is more... It's more to do with the public perception of how we see our politicians and taking into account victims as well in this. Um, so it's, it's trying to strike the right balance. I understand that my amendments probably do, do not comply with the, the Scotland Act or the Human Rights Act, um, but that's why I won't be pressing today. But I do think a further discussion needs to be had on this, um, because I think it's right that 
as an elected representative, we represent the values in, in this place. And I think it would be, I understand what you're saying about there's a length of time that people are put on the, the, the requirements register, if, if you want to say that. However, I wouldn't feel comfortable personally if someone had been on it for 15 years and then a year later they became my, my representative. So that, that's where I'm coming from with this one. Um, I'll now move to my, my colleague Graeme Simpson's amendments, um, as well as Amendment 58. They do seek to end dual mandates um, from mem so that MS MPs and members of the House of Lords or councillors um, could not be elected as MSPs. And I do think it does provide a valuable opportunity for us to have a discussion around this. I just don't necessarily think that this is the right time to have the discussion at stage two of this bill. Um, and as the Minister has pointed out, he has written and offered to put these amendments forward for consultation. Um, I think that's the right thing to do. And I think as a committee, we would welcome that opportunity to have further clarification and discussion on these. Um, and also, for the same reasons, Amendment 59, I think, again, I think it becomes a further discussion um, on this. Um, an Amendment 61, in the name of um, my colleague Ross Greer, would require the Electoral Management Board to have a list of people subject to disqualification orders. And I think that I, wouldn't, I couldn't support that at this moment in time unless the Minister could assure us of further funding for the Management Board to allow that to happen. But that ends my, my contribution. Thank you very much, Convener. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Member. And again, just as a, a point of clarification, I think we're talking about the Venice Commission rather than the Vienna Commission. Um, <laughs> Graeme Simpson to speak to Amendment 1. Well, I'm unlikely to give way, but I'm, I'm prepared to hear the Minister. Um, it is a mistake I frequently make, and I <laughs> apologise. There's been so many important commissions and conventions in Vienna over history. Uh, very different. Indeed, but very different. <laughs> Graeme Simpson, um, can I invite you to speak to Amendment 1 and the other amendments in the group? Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, if, if I can start by saying that I, th I think uh, the value of stage two is, is having the ability to raise issues <clears throat> such as the ones I'm raising in my three amendments, um, which haven't come out of the blue because the, they were mentioned, dual mandate was mentioned in the committee's report, uh, the committee's very good report. Uh, and I spoke in the stage one debate uh, and I was very, very honest, as I always am. Uh, I said there are different views on dual mandate, including within my own party. There are different views. But it's entirely right, I think, that we have this discussion. Um, and if you'll permit me, um, I've got from Spice, and it's available to anyone, a list of MSPs who have had dual mandate. I'm going to go through that list all the way from session one, because it's interesting, and I think people will find it interesting. So it's quite a long list. It's going to take me a bit of time, but I'll read qu quicker than I normally speak. Um, Do so, because it is on the public record. But it, I'm happy it for is. to go into the but record I'd, here. I just found it fascinating as I was looking at this issue. So session one, a number of MSPs who were also members of the House of Lords James Douglas Hamilton, David Steele, Mike Watson. MSPs who are also MPs, you'd expect quite a lot in session one, there were. Malcolm Chisholm, Rosanna Cunningham, Donald Dewar, Margaret Ewing, Sam Galbraith, Donald Gorry, John Home Robertson, John McCallion, Henry McLeish, Alistair Morgan, Alex Salmon, John Swinney, Jim Wallace, and Andrew Welsh. Session two, um, a couple uh, who were members of the Lords, James Douglas Hamilton and Mike Watson. Uh, and then I don't see any uh, in that session who were MPs, but we start to see councillors coming through. Andrew Arbuckle, Charlie Gordon and Mike Pringle. And then on to session three. Uh, again, we have some who were members of the Lords, George Fawkes, Jack McConnell, Nicole Stephen. Um, some who were MPs, Margaret Curran, Cathy Jameson, and Alex Sand again. Uh, the ones who were councillors in session three 
Willie Coffey, Jim Hume, Bill Kidd, John Wilson, Nigel Don, and uh, I'll apologise here because I can't quite pronounce the name, Stefan Timchevic, I think, something like that, <laughs> close. Um, and then session four, this is quite, this is quite a long list. Um, MSPs who are also in the Lords, Annabel Goldie. MSPs who are councillors, George Adam, Claire Adamson, Jane Baxter, Colin Beatty, Leslie Brennan, Neil Bibby, Willie Coffey, James Dornan, Mary Fee, Neil Finlay, John Finney, Mark Griffin, Cara Hilton, Jim Hume, Alison Johnson, Colin Keir, Richard Lyle, Angus MacDonald, Derek Mackay, Hanzala Malik, Mark MacDonald, Margaret MacDougall, Anne MacTaggart, John Pentland, Alex Rowley, Kevin Stewart, David Torrance, Jean Urquhart and Bill Walker. Um, then session five, uh, MSPs who were also MPs at, at some point, um, Douglas Ross and Ross Thompson. And then it's it's actually a very long list of councillors. I won't go through it, but it's a very long list. I would list. be grateful but, if we could return think, to your amendments. I think, I think um, what, we go, what we find is throughout the sessions, you see the number of MSPs who are MPs tails off. So we have a small number. Uh, and the number who, in every session now, who have been councillors, and that includes myself, I was a councillor, that number increases. So in every single election, you have quite a large number elected to this place who, who were councillors at the time of election. Um, and so on that point, uh, I think the point that, that the minister makes is well made that to do anything about councillors now would be, would be wrong. So I wouldn't be in, intending to press that. Now, I've heard what the minister has said. I've, seen, I've obviously seen um, his, his letter um, and I've reflected on, on what he said. And I've reflected on what he said today, that he wants to launch a, a consultation uh, in this session. And I think that's very useful. I am of the clear view that this would be the right, this is the right thing to do. It would, to ban dual mandate um, for MSPs sitting as MPs and indeed in the House of Lords, and I'll come on to that. I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's what the public would expect us to do. And I, I think they just expect people to behave in the right way if you are elected uh, to two places, uh, Westminster or here, make a choice. Um, but I think if we bring it into law, it brings us into line with Wales and Northern Ireland. Why should Scotland be an outrider? However, um, I accept that uh, it, it, I don't think it's that complicated. I think it's quite an easy issue, but I do accept that there, sh there ought to be some consultation. So I think on that basis, I'm right. I think I'm right. I think I've got I've got the, the public pulse on this issue, but um, this may not be the place to do it. So on that basis, I wouldn't be intending to press those amendments. And that's, uh, that's actually, I've actually had intended to press them, but having heard from the minister earlier, if he's going to move a pace with that consultation, mm -hmm. um, I'd be happy not, not to move those amendments um, on that basis. It will take us, unfortunately, into the next session. I think it would be unfortunate. I think that's unfortunate. Um, we could have um, MP, people who are currently MPs standing for election to this place um, in 2026, getting elected and then not having to resign. Um, I'm sure we can all think of potential uh, candidates uh, for that. Um, I won't name anyone, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've got people in mind. Um, I think it's unfortunate, that, that would be unfortunate, but I do accept what the Minister's saying. And uh, if I could just mention 
the House of Lords uh, amendment. So my amendment uh, would would say that anyone who who is a lord could stand uh, to this place um, if they were elected. They could either resign completely or take a leave of absence, uh, which is what Katie Clark has done. Um, I think she's done the right thing, but that. My, my proposal would just put that in, into law. Um, Ross Greer's amendment goes further. Um, so I disagree with Ross, Ross Greer on, on this one. I, I think we should allow um, the Katie Clark position uh, as a matter of law. But I should leave it there. Thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful to the member. Um, I am conscious of time, this being a Thursday, and it's an important day in this <coughs> parliament. And so if I can remind members um, to be speaking directly to their amendments, they will find me more sympathetic um, and less likely to intervene. And with that, Russ Greer, would you like to speak to Amendment 58 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, um, convener. And just to start off, I would make the point that as much as I am grateful for the various offers that the ministers made to take some of the issues raised uh, as part of this process to consultation, uh, we're now heading towards the point where the government's committing to a consultation on dual mandates, residence requirements, deposit reform and by-election reform. Um, we're getting to the point where there's going to be further consultation on more issues than are actually contained in this bill in the first place, which I does think indicate the issue that I raised before, that this was a missed opportunity to, to take forward a more holistic and substantive package of, of reform. But nonetheless, on um, 58, 58 just seeks to end the anomaly where uh, peers, quite rightly, cannot be MPs. They can't even vote in a general election, uh, but they can currently be an MSP. Uh, it is not a judgment on individual peers who've been MSPs. It's purely about the principle of democratic accountability. So it's somewhat different to the uh, dual mandate amendments that Graham Simpson's brought forward because it's not concerned about somebody's ability to do two jobs simultaneously. It's more focused on this issue of uh, democratic accountability. You know, the Lords is not a democratic uh, institution by, by definition. Um, it's unaccountable. They make law, but they're not accountable to the public. Um, I find that to be an affront uh, to parliamentary democracy. I think it's contrary to the values of this parliament, um, peers are absolutely free to become MSPs. They should just resign from the Lords first. So it's a simple amendment following through on that simple principle. I welcome the government's to, uh, commitment to consult on this. Um, I don't think that that in and of itself is necessarily a reason for uh, parliament not to move forward with it for the, the 2026 election. But nonetheless, we, we are where we are. Uh, on that, and I should just put on the, the record that I did um, speak directly to um, Katie Clark before lodging this amendment, particularly to emphasise that this is not about uh, individuals, it's about a democratic principle, and of course it would only apply from, from the next election, it wouldn't apply to anybody currently in that position, i.e. Ms Clark. Um, on 60 and 62, the aggravators, um, just to to clarify a little bit what the, the minister was indicating there, so 1662 would give those sentencing someone who's convicted uh, of an offence against the, the categories of people involved in the elections, the ability to, the option of reflecting on the harm done to the democratic system at large by that offence. It doesn't mandate a, a more substantive or a different sentence. Uh, it simply gives those sentencing the option uh, to consider that, because I think we should recognise that as well as the, the harm against the, the individual, there is a harm against the democratic process as a whole as a, whole, uh, as a result of these offences. And the minister quite rightly made the point that we have seen rising concern over recent years. Uh, you know, our democracy is under a bit of pressure, not as much pressure as uh, some other uh, nations, uh, but under increasing pressure and those involved in our democracy are under increasing hostility, something that I've, I've no doubt we've all um, experienced. So this simply gives those sentencing the additional option, you know, this was only going to apply to those who are being convicted of an offence uh, where that offence uh, is directed at one of these um, six categories of people. So there's the option to consider that as an aggravator in the way, as the Minister mentioned, is also an option for um, emergency service workers. So on 61, the disqualification register, um, I've brought this forward because I think this is quite a, a simple one. As has already been mentioned, there, there is no list of disqualified um, individuals. We have a system that relies on self-policing by those who've been disqualified, who by definition, by and large, have been disqualified uh, because of their conduct in relation to the electoral process, offences committed against those involved in the electoral process. So these are people generally who are going to be on the disqualification register because by definition uh, they don't particularly respect the democratic process uh, as it stands. 
Um, I think the Electoral Management Board is the appropriate body to, to maintain that list and to make it accessible to the uh, returning officers. I, as I've already pointed out, this wouldn't require anybody to check 2,500 names off of a list. I mean, for a start, that 2,500 is divided by 32 at a uh, local council election. Uh, but you would also be checking the smaller list against the, uh, the larger one rather than the, the other way around. Uh, so in that regard, I think this is a, a simple amendment uh, that would be a, a small additional cost, because we are talking about a, thankfully, relatively small list, a, a small number of individuals, uh, because I think that per, with this particular group of individuals, given that we're talking about people who have already, by definition, disrespected the democratic process, to rely on self-policing by them feels to me like a, a vulnerability. Um, so that is uh, the, the collection of amendments I'm moving forward at, at this stage. Thanks, Convener. I'm grateful. And Ben McPherson, can I ask you, invite you to speak to Amendment 59 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Convener, and good morning, colleagues. Um, first of all, I would like to say on Amendment uh, 59, thank you to the Minister and his officials for the engagement on this, and also to the Electoral Commission for their briefing in advance of today, which uh, made reference to uh, the Amendment 59 in my name. There Submission of Amendment 59 for consideration today came as a result of a number of discussions over the summer regarding some matters uh, in the public discourse following the general election in July. And it probed me uh, and uh, others to, to think about the rules in terms of the connection of people standing for this institution, for this parliament and their local connection to Scotland. Having considered that as a wider issue and with this bill at stage two, it felt right and pertinent for me to explore the possibility of an amendment in this uh, space <coughs> of, you know, are our legal obligations and rules strict enough in order to make sure that people who are standing and then elected to the Scottish Parliament have a connection that is suitable and appropriate to the people of Scotland and uh, to the communities that they would then serve and, and would be seeking to represent as a candidate. There were a number of ways of potentially submitting this. Uh, I chose ordinarily resident. Uh, there could have been uh, an amendment to habitually be resident, which is a higher test. Uh, and potentially there could also be an obligation to be registered to vote in the Scottish Parliament elections in one of the constituencies or region. However, uh, to be proportionate and balanced, I decided to submit a ordinary residence. Um, I, I think the Minister's points and those of the Electoral Commission around this being a significant matter, um, not just in terms of considering uh, how it operates within the Scotland Act, but also how it uh, is also uh, how, how matters are considered with the rights of people and the requirements that there are to stand in UK elections, um, Commonwealth uh, and immigration uh, restrictions. So um, I'm, I'm happy to not press this amendment at stage two, but I do think this is an issue to consider going forward. And I, I am pleased that the Minister is, along with other matters that have been raised by colleagues, committing to a further consultation. I mean, regarding that point, not just my Amendment 59, but also amendments that have been raised by colleagues, I do think um, the fact that that consultation will not be able to be implemented under the current proposal until the next parliamentary term means that these sorts of potentially quite important issues would not be changed until before the election in 2031. Now, given uh, the fact that we have a bill here, to me, you know, there is a question of, with full appreciation to the fact that the parliamentary timetable for the rest of this session is very packed, but, you know, should the committee and the government, you know, it potentially be considering is there scope for that consultation to take place between 
stage two and stage three and stage three to be delayed in order for this bill to to be what it could be. Um, but I know also the government will be under an, uh, will, be, will be under an obligation to uh, pass and then uh, implement this bill ahead of the 2026 election, and there needs to there needs to be a suitable time frame Technical for that. I will, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wonder if, if uh, Ben McPherson um, thinks that there is a danger um, with all these welcome consultations that it could look like the government is trying to park issues, um, kick them into the long, long grass, uh, because I think Ben McPherson is right that um, if, if these matters uh, are not dealt with in this bill, then we, we, we could need another bill in, in the next session, uh, and it could be you know, many, many, many years before there's any action on this. I, I don't question the government's good faith. But I do think, not just in this bill, but more widely, there's, there's a challenge in the fact that bills with scope to make changes only come around every so often in all subject areas. So, uh, and you know, passing bills is a, is a significant process and we should utilise each bill to make the changes that the people um, may wish to see. So uh, I think it's right that these issues have been raised at stage two. I think that will be an important consultation um, whether there's scope or uh, uh, practical ability or um, enthusiasm from the committee of the parliament, the government, to, to perhaps have a longer period between stage two and stage three is something I'll leave for others to, to consider. Um, just lastly, with regard to my amendment, I do think, uh, so in, in submitting it, you will notice that uh, the pronoun um, is he, and that is because the pronoun in the Scotland Act 1998 is he. And I do think uh, it would be appropriate for the committee and parliament and the government to consider ahead of stage three whether uh, it would be possible to change that pronoun across the, the whole criteria, because we are, of, co of course, in a position where we are seeking to continually um, see a more uh, equal and representative parliament reflective of the, uh, Scotland with more um, female MSPs and I just think it's archaic that that language is still used. Thank you. I'm grateful to the member and call Sue Webber. Thanks convener. It was just to ask the minister for some clarification because you didn't specifically speak to amendment 20 in your remarks and um, as, I, as I understand it you, this amendment is meaning that any MSP in this session who was placed on the sex offenders register or whatever would not be disqualified until the next Holyrood election as this would be not be compatible with protocol one article three I was just wondering if that is the situation minister from my understanding is that okay yeah well I'm going about to call the minister to wind up I hope he can deal with that in that contribution well, it, or would you like to deal with it separately, Minister? I'm more than content to take it. I'm happy to, to deal with it at the end if you'd, you'd like. I'm happy with that. that. Grateful. Conscious <laughs> it's a debate. So. <laughs> Minister, to wind up on Amendment 8. OK. Well, first of all, um, uh, let me say, uh, can we have underlined at the top, Venice, not Vienna. It is a mistake <laughs> I uh, make uh, frequently. Uh, let me uh, start with... Um, Ms Weber's uh, point, um, lest I, I forget, I mean, she's, she's right, it does create um, a transitional uh, provision. Uh, again, um, uh, she, she cited uh, the, the Convention, that's the very purpose of it. We do need to strike the balance between creating a set of provisions that will fundamentally improve, uh, I believe, public safety and uh, also trust in our democratic system, but in a way that is proportionate against the requirements uh, against uh, the, the Venice, I nearly said Vienna again, uh, came over, Venice uh, Commission uh, requirements around disqualification of uh, parliamentarians. I suppose the fundamental point is there should be a high bar, a high threshold for 
um, uh, disbarring someone who's already in uh, elected office. So we just need to uh, approach that uh, carefully. I'm happy to give way if Ms Webber's... It, no, it's just uh, another point. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Convener. The Protocol 1, Article 3, it also states it only concerns legislative bodies. And I'm looking for clarification because since councils are not legislative bodies, would in theory it be possible to get these changes in place at council level as soon as the bill is passed? Um, and then I'm wondering that perhaps we might have to, the Minister and I have further discussions maybe for stage three to look at an amendment which would at least put these changes in place at local authority as well. So there's that sort of uh, equality. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just... I beg pardon, can you? I'm, I'm just being uh, reminded of my not being clear enough. I'm referring to those that uh, have already um, on a, a, a notice. If after commencement someone is subsequently found to uh, have uh, acted uh, uh, in a way that they are on any order, then they will be uh, uh, disqualified. So it's only covering those that are effectively covered by such an order just now. If any, the number will be pretty small, I suggest, and I have no evidence to suggest there are any. So, you know, I would refer back to the, the point uh, I made already around proportionality and just trying to, to, to make sure we have reassurance that we're compliant with uh, our uh, wider obligations. But anyone who commits uh, an offence or anyone who is subject to a, an order going forward once we've commenced the provisions, even if they're elected now, would be uh, caught up by uh, such a, a disqualification. I hope that provides the reassurance Ms Webber was, was looking for. But, of course, if she wants to discuss it further, I'm happy to. Let me turn, uh, convenience to some of the uh, comments. We'll cover all of them. Uh, but uh, some of the comments uh, colleagues have made uh, on Ms Wells' points, I'll go back to the point I made in speaking to the amendments. I completely understand uh, her uh, concerns uh, as just a matter of trying to get the balance right. I would observe that uh, uh, her colleague, um, before Ms Webber came on uh, the committee, uh, Oliver Mundell, was actually asking me, almost expressing the opposite point of view, you know, are we satisfied that what we are seeking to do is compliant with ECHR, almost suggesting, you know, we've got to, to be, be, be cautious. And, you know, I said at the time, yes, I was, and I will say now, yes, I am. But if we take that step further, I think we are at risk of, of uh, not being so. But, of course, I'm happy to, to discuss these uh, matters uh, with her. Uh, Mr Simpson's point, um, he talks about the, the value of uh, stage uh, two. Mr Greer and Mr McPherson have also spoken uh, about that. I completely uh, accept that point. He is right that uh, the committee, uh, the issue of dual mandates was raised. He raised it in debate that it was raised at, at the committee. Um, all I would say is that you know, paragraph 350 of your report, Convener, whilst it reflects some comments by witnesses on dual mandates, there was no recommendation for me to uh, act upon. I suppose that was the, the point I was uh, making uh, uh, in relation to that. Um, I, I was very happy, incidentally, to hear his list of uh, all those who have been elected with a, a dual mandate, a reminder of many colleagues from the past, and was happy to have been reminded of most uh, of them, uh, and also happy to have uh, not been one uh, of them. Uh, but uh, I appreciate that he's uh, not uh, pressing his amendments. He said that he's of the clear view, um, and he's clearly given this some consideration. He's of the clear view that what he, is, uh, what he sought to bring forward is dealing uh, with uh, the policy matter in, uh, in the, the right way. But he uh, did um, seem to accept the need for consultation, I would make clear to him this is not an attempt to kick these matters into the uh, long uh, grass. I, I would just observe you know, the bill that we are debating uh, today was subject to thorough and rigorous consultation. You know, the area of um, sex offenders was subject to consultation uh, last year, which shows we can move uh, quite uh, quickly on uh, these uh, matters. Uh, uh, so it, it is not an attempt to do that. It is a, a genuine attempt to give proper uh, consideration to uh, these matters and you know I suppose that kind of relates to the points that Mr Greer has uh, made you know he talks about um, you know the fact that we're moving to consultation maybe suggest that this bill has been a missed opportunity I think what it actually rather reflects is that this bill it was never going to be uh, the last word or the last time that we will seek to legislate on uh, issues of eligibility to be a candidate uh, or indeed uh, to 
remain as a, a parliamentarian or a councillor on the basis of this qualification. I would observe, uh, convener, that this will not be the only bill this session. Mr Simpson has a bill that he is uh, seeking to take forward that touches on some of uh, these issues. On his, um, on Mr Greer's points around aggravators, I understand his point. I think we all share the significant concerns there are around what I think he rightly describes. Of course, they are uh, fundamentally attacks, assaults on the individual, but collectively could be felt to be uh, an attack on our democratic uh, process. I suppose, uh, and, and in that sense, I'm sympathetic to the, what he's trying to achieve. I just think we need to think through what the wider ramifications might be, uh, for example, on uh, sentencing policy. I understand the point he made that it, you know, it's only a factor that the courts may take into account, but nonetheless, that still would have I think a consequential impact, and we need to understand better what that might be. On his point about uh, the list that he suggests the uh, Electoral Management Board should have to uh, maintain, I, I do recognise and concede entirely it's a very simple, straightforward amendment, it's a very simple, straightforward uh, proposition. It would, as Annie Wells uh, talked about, of course it would come uh, with uh, cost. How considerable that cost might be, I don't know. We would need to uh, to, to look at it, they would then near, uh, clearly need to uh, consider how we uh, resource uh, that. But you know, if um, Parliament is minded to support this provision, then of course we, we would need to, to do so. I think my wider point is, and again I accept that this isn't necessarily what Mr Greer is seeking mm -hmm. to do, but it does take us in a direction of travel that there is a more substantial process for those involved in the process of uh, accepting, receiving nominations to start almost vetting them. And I think that's quite a big change to our system. I'm not convinced it's uh, required. And I would, again, I would go back to the letter that the Convener Electoral Management Board has sent to this committee where he himself has set out some uh, concerns, saying you know, this would be a fairly substantial change to the, the process. Uh, and lastly, on uh, Mr... Um, uh, McPherson's uh, points, uh, in particular reference to his Amendment 59, I recognise he has given some thought to uh, this uh, issue. He's uh, given uh, a, a considered uh, position, um, indeed as all members have in uh, relation to the amendments they've brought forward today. I have some sympathy with the points that he uh, makes, but I do think it needs wider consideration because, you know, if we legislate at haste, what are the things that we've maybe not thought through uh, in relation to such uh, a requirement. I um, do appreciate that what I'm asking the committee to agree to would mean that realistically any subsequent changes we'd make around these areas would not take effect until the next scheduled uh, election uh, after next uh, 2031. Um, that's just the reality. I'm not going to shy away from that. Indeed, I was pretty clear about that in my letter, so I wanted to be upfront about that. In relation to Mr McPherson's uh, suggestion that we could potentially delay uh, the period between stage two and stage three, I am not minded uh, to do that um, for uh, a multitude of reasons. Uh, with my uh, Minister of Parliamentary Business hat uh, on, um, uh, well, that is my hat, but in, with the confines of uh, this particular bill, um, you know, we've got a wider programme of legislation to manage to get through this at Parliament, so I need to bear that in mind. But actually, more fundamentally, in terms of the legislation itself, I also have to be mindful of the Nolan uh, principles around ensuring that those who are involved in the Gould <laughs> principles... I'm getting a lot of things mixed up today. I'm sure you'd have pointed that out. Uh, uh, convener, the Gould uh, principles uh, are such that those involved in the administration of elections, returning officers, uh, the Electoral Commission, must have uh, the appropriate uh, lead-in time, at least six months, and any delay to the um, process of us legislating and then going through commencement puts that at jeopardy. So I understand the request. I just think I have to balance it with that. And lastly, you'll be glad to hear, uh, Convener, on Mr McPherson's point about pronouns. Uh, I agree with uh, the point. I've already asked, because he raised this with me directly, I've already asked officials 
uh, to look at this area. Uh, sometimes what might seem to be a very simple, straightforward process, of course, isn't always uh, necessarily so, but uh, we will look at it and we'll see what can be done. Um, can I turn to Annie Wells to invite to wind up, press or withdraw Amendment 8A? Um, I have nothing further to say, but I will not be pressing, so withdraw 8A. So Annie Wells uh, seeks to withdraw Amendment 8A. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? There are no objections, so the amendment is withdrawn. Minister, to press or withdraw Amendment 8? I, oh, I am pressing, uh, can you... That's my enthusiasm. <laughs> the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 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 Call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 8. Minister, to move formally. It moved. It can go. And I call Amendment 9A in the name of Annie Wells already debated with Amendment 8. Annie Wells, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. Um, Minister, to press or withdraw Amendment 9? It moved. Or oh, pressed, sorry. Can you... Grateful. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 1 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with <coughs> Amendment 8. Graeme Simpson, to move or not move? Not moved. Um, call Amendment 2 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 8. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Grateful. Call <coughs> Amendment 58 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 8. Ross Greer to move or not move? Not move, convener. Grateful. Call Amendment 3 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 8. Graham Simpson to move <coughs> or not move? Not moved. Grateful. Call Amendment 59 in the name of Ben McPherson, already debated with Amendment 8. Ben McPherson, my apologies, Ben. Ben McPherson to move or not move? Not moved. Grateful. Call Amendment 60 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 8. Ross Greer to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. We are not uh, agreed, so therefore there will be a division. Can I invite committee members to keep their hands up while the clerk annotates um, their vote? Firstly, those in favour of the amendment, can you raise your hand? Those against? Abstentions? As a result, there is a tie, and I am invited to exercise my casting vote. My casting vote is against the... Im oh, sorry. Applying brevity too swiftly. <laughs> the results of the division were total votes for two, total votes against two, total abstentions one. There is therefore a tie, and I am invited to exercise my casting vote. My casting vote is against the amendment, the amendment is therefore disagreed to. Um, I have no idea where we are. Ben McPherson. Oh. Yes, the question is now that section three be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes, oh, yes. Ah. And the question is that the schedule be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Grateful. Now call Amendment 61 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 8. Ross Greer to move or not move? Not move, Commissioner. Grateful. Um, the question is that sections 4 to 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. <coughs> now call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 8. Minister to move formally. Moved, Commissioner. Grateful. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 8. Minister to move formally. Moved, Convener. Grateful. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 9 to 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
I now call Amendment 62 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 8. Ross Greer to move or not move? Not move, Convener. Grateful. I now move to Section 12. And I call Amendments 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 and 19, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated. I'm going to invite the Minister to remove Amendments 12 to 19 on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 12 to 19 inclusive? No? Yeah. Minister to move formally. Move to convene. Um, and the question is that Amendments 12 to 19 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Grateful. The question is that Section 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 8. Minister to move formally. Move to convene. And I call Amendment 20A in the name of Annie Wells, that's already been debated with Amendment 8. Annie Wells to move or not move? Not moved, Convener. Excellent. Thank you. I call Amendment 20B in the name of Annie Wells, already debated with Amendment 8. Annie Wells to move or not move? Not moved, Convener. And the question... Uh, Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 20? I shall press that. Um, Thank you. Yes. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And the question is that sections 13 and 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I now call Amendment 21 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own. Minister to move and speak to Amendment 21. Uh, I, I suspect this will be a shorter debate, Convener, but maybe I've tempted fate. Convener, I bring forward the Government's Amendment 21 to reflect the recommendation made by the Committee in its Stage 1 report on the Bill. The Bill is introduced that allows Ministers to amend the categories of persons eligible to register as third-party third campaigners of the Electoral Commission. To remove or vary a category will require consultation with the Commission, but the addition of a category would not. If this amendment follows the Committee's Stage 1 recommendation. It means that Ministers will only be able to add a category of third-party campaigner following a recommendation by the Electoral Commission. This reflects broad agreement that the Electoral Commission should be a key part of the decision-making process in this type of change to campaigning rules. I agree it's important to maintain confidence in this system and that it remains free from any perception of possible political influence, requiring a recommendation from the Electoral Commission for any changes to categories of third-party campaigners is a helpful safeguard in this respect and provides for consistency of approach to all amendments to the categories of persons eligible to register as third-party campaigners. And I invite the committee to support the amendment in this group in my name and I move Amendment 21. I'm grateful, Minister. I have no indications of any other member wishing to speak, so, Minister, would you like to wind up? I will not extend your patience, Convener. <laughs> <laughs> well read. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 16 to 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I now call Amendment 22 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move Amendment 22 and speak to all the amendments in the group. It, convener, I would uh, urge the committee to support my amendments in this group relating to postponement of elections. The Bill's provisions on emergency rescheduling of elections are deliberately designed to restrict the postponement of an election by an office holder, such as the convener of the Electoral Management Board. I think such decisions should be made by Parliament, if at all possible. The principal purpose of the nationwide postponement provision was to provide uh, time to allow Parliament to pass a bill to set a new date for the local election. I am clear that there was never an intention to suggest that a nationwide local government election could be straightforwardly rearranged within two or even four weeks. Uh, local government elections are complex and challenging to deliver because of the e-counting system required to calculate results under the STV voting system used. Rather than give the convener of the Electoral Management Board for Scotland the power to postpone an election by, say, six months, the bill provides for a limited postponement during which Parliament can decide whether or not it wishes to pass emergency legislation. Having heard the evidence at stage one, I accept the maximum period could be helpfully increased to four weeks, and this is achieved by Amendments 25 and 29. 
I think this is most likely to be of assistance at a local level when an individual returning officer will be able to make a decision to postpone the election in that authority area based on local circumstances. It can be that this could mean up to eight weeks in individual areas as the EMB convener's power to postpone could be followed by a local postponement by a returning officer. The other amendments reflect the committee's recommendation in its stage one report to ensure wider understanding of and confidence in decisions taken to reschedule or cancel an election. Uh, the bill, as introduced, contains provisions to make arrangements to postpone elections and, in the case of certain by-elections, cancel them. These amendments change part four of the bill to require that when, in relation to the Scottish Parliament, the presiding officer, and when, in relation to local government, the convener of the electoral management board or relevant returning officer exercise their power to postpone or cancel election, they must also publish a statement setting out the reasons. As I said in my letter of the 16th of May to your committee, it can be the Bill's provisions on emergency rescheduling seek to cover situations where postponement is considered essential but are deliberately not prescriptive. It is right that those who are entrusted with making these important decisions are not unduly constrained in doing so and are able to draw on their experience and judgment as to take account of as wide a range of possible emergency situations, both local and national. Yeah, that said, I also agree with the committee's assessment that such decisions that impact on the democratic functioning of our country are easily understood and command as much confidence as possible amongst the public, requiring the person who makes the decision to postpone or cancel an election to publish a statement setting out the reasons for the decision will help in both regards and adds an important extra layer of transparency and accountability into the process. I invite the committee to support the amendments in this group and I move Amendment 22. I'm grateful, Minister. I've had no indication that any member wishes to speak. Do you wish to add anything in your wind-up, Minister? Uh, again, I will not uh, irk you, Convener. No. I'm grateful. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that Sections 21 and 22 be agreed to. Are we in agreement? Grateful. I now call Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 26, 27, 30, 44, 45 and 48. And I invite the Minister to move Amendment 23 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, the amendments in uh, this group are technical uh, adjustments grouped with amendments which make tidy up drafting or minor typos in the bill as introduced and no policy changes. Amendment 23 adjusts section 23 of the bill for technical reasons. That section has introduced amend section 46 of the Scotland Act 1998 to add two new subsections to take account of any delay in Parliament meeting after a rescheduled election. However, because the Scottish Parliament can only modify certain listed provisions in the Scotland Act, that structure meant that there arguably could be doubt about whether the Parliament, our Parliament, would be able to amend the section further in future. The amendment restructures the proposed amendments to leave no doubt the text can be changed in future by this Parliament, if so desired. Amendments 26, 27 and 30 add the Secretary of State to the list of consultees when the convener of the Electoral Management Board or a returning officer is considering rescheduling a local government election this is, to, as this is to ensure that any rescheduled local election does not fall on the same day as a UK parliamentary election. While this situation arising is, of course, considered unlikely, convener, if this were to happen, it would result in a combined election, which would add considerable complexity for administrators and risk voter confusion. Turning to Amendment 44, existing secondary legislation powers for Scottish Parliament elections allow ministers to make provision sub-delegating certain responsibilities to other persons. The specific sub-delegation that we have been considering is a requirement in the Electoral Commission to provide guidance in ways in which returning officers can assist voters with accessibility needs. The Government plans to legislate on that guidance in 2025 in relation to Scottish Parliament elections and before 2027 in relation to local elections. We have established, as the legislation currently stands, Scottish Ministers have the necessary powers to legislate to the Electoral Commission to provide guidance for Scottish Parliament elections, but not the power to do so for Council elections. Amendment 44 
therefore seeks to change uh, these powers uh, in relation to local government elections to match their existing powers for parliamentary elections in relation to subdelegation. It will allow secondary legislation and council elections to refer to documents such as guidance or forms prepared by the Electoral Commission mm -hmm. and others uh, that will, and will provide that those documents form part of the rules in relation to local elections. Uh, amendment 45 uh, just simply corrects a typo. Uh, similar Amendment 44 corrects an inconsistency in language where the word code appears when it should say plan. Uh, I invite the committee to support the straightforward amendments <laughs> in this group in my name and I move Amendment 23. I am grateful, Minister. I have had no indication of any other member wishing to contribute. Minister, to wind up. If you want to I think I have had my piece. <laughs> Excellent. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Grateful. The question is that Section 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I am now going to call Amendment 24 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 22. The Minister to move formally. It moved, convener. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm grateful. The question is that Section 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Grateful. I intend to call Amendments 25, 26, 27 and 28, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated. And I invited the Minister to move Amendments 25 to 28 on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 25 to 28? I'm grateful. Yes. Minister to move on block. It moved, Gibbia. And um, the, question, the question is that amendments 25 to 28 be agreed to. Yes. Grateful. Um, the question is that section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Now I'm going to call amendments 29, 30 and 31, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Minister to move amendments 29 to 31 on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on this no. amendment? Minister to move on block formally. Moved, convener. Are we in agreement with amendments 29 to 31? Yes, yes. I'm grateful. Um, the, the question now is, is section 26 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendments 32, 33 and 34, all in the name of the Minister, already debated. I, invite, I will invite the Minister to move the amendments 32 to 34 on block. Does any member object to a single question being asked? No. no. Minister to move formally. Moved, Convener. And are we in agreement with amendments 32 to 34? Yes. Grateful. The question is that section 27 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. Excellent. I call... Amendment 63, in the name of Ross Greer, a grouped with Amendments 64 and 65. Ross Greer to move Amendment 63 and to speak to all amendments in this group. Thanks, Convener, and you'll be glad to know I'm only going to speak to uh, these very briefly, um, because I, I believe they align with uh, the Government's intentions regardless. I'm just going to use two examples to illustrate uh, why I think these are necessary, one for agents, one for, for candidates. So 64 and 65 deal with uh, the requirement for, uh, at present for election agents to use their home address. Um, we had uh, an incident uh, in the relatively uh, recent past uh, where uh, an individual turned up at the home address of one of our party election agents on uh, the weekend after the election uh, because they were uh, seeking the candidate, the successful candidate, who had thus been elected, the candidate had quite reasonably uh, not uh, used their home address uh, as part of the, the nomination process, but the election agent's home address was uh, able to be found by this individual. Now, thankfully, that incident didn't escalate, but it illustrates uh, the need for us to carry over the uh, option for candidates to their election agents to ensure everybody involved in this process can, can engage with it safely. Um, 63 um, adds a, a new option for candidates to state the ward uh, that they live in. So at present, candidates can uh, state the local authority they live in, their constituency where, where that's relevant. Um, I'm, the example that I'm going to use for 63 is the, the recent Arran uh, by-election. So Arran uh, and Cumbria are the, the two islands contained in the uh, North Ayrshire Council area. Uh, for residents on Arran, as you would uh, expect, uh, knowing that the candidates live on the island is very important to them, knowing that candidates understand uh, life on, in an island uh, community is important to them. Uh, there was one candidate uh, who one of the parties put forward who did not live on the island. This made 
other candidates who were themselves Aran residents uh, feel under pressure to publish their home address to demonstrate they lived there because the other option was just simply to state that they lived in the North Ayrshire Council area, uh, which meant they could have lived in Irvine, Kilwinning, Ardrossan, uh, and i.e. not on the island, not having that lived experience of, of island life. Uh, so I've had a number of uh, people approach me and say that they, they want to be able to demonstrate that they have a connection with the relevant community. This doesn't just apply to islands, particularly in larger local authority areas, demonstrating that you live in the area is important. They wanted to be able to demonstrate that without compromising their and their family's safety by publishing their home address. So this is simply to give that additional option of uh, stating what ward you live in to clarify your connection to the community. Thank you, Convener. I'm grateful, Ross Greer. I've had no other indication from members. Minister, I can come to you. Quickly, uh, you will recall that uh, this is an area we were already looking at. We received a positive response to the consultation we had held on uh, looking at making these changes through secondary legislation. I also see the Electoral Commission is uh, in writing to the committee supporting the amendments in this group. I am uh, supportive of the policy intent uh, behind the amendments. As uh, Mr Greer alludes to, we would have sought to make them through a second legislation, but these amendments enable us to do so now. I am happy to support uh, the amendments in this group, uh, therefore. Um, I will say just quickly as well, Convener, you recall that we have written about plans for other changes through future second legislation, and I commit now to continue to keep the committee up to speed with those changes, but of course that is for down the line. Uh, today, I would urge the committee to support Mr Greer's amendments. I'm grateful. Ross Greer to wind up press or withdraw Amendment 63. Uh, nothing further to add, Convener, so I'll be pressing Amendment 63. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Call Amendment 64 in the name of Ross Greer. Already debated with Amendment 63. Ross Greer to move or not move? To move, Convener. Grateful. The question is that Amendment 64 um, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Grateful. Call Amendment 65 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 63. Ross Greer to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Excellent. I call Amendment 66 in the name of Ross Greer, grouped with Amendment 67. Ross Greer to move Amendment 66 and to speak to both amendments in this group. Thanks, Convener. Um, the question of randomising ballot paper or the advantage or disadvantage of uh, alphabetical on, on the ballot paper is not unique to Scotland or the UK. I'm sure it's an issue that, that members will be familiar with. This is a, a long-standing area of debate in all parliamentary uh, democracies. So there is strong evidence that appearing at the top of the ballot paper uh, is an advantage. There was a uh, quite comprehensive um, study in 2015 in Denmark uh, that found um, on average a 4% advantage to the candidates at the, the top of ballot papers. Now, the advantage might not be as significant as 4% um, in Scotland. There hasn't been the same uh, rigorous uh, study here, but there's plenty of other studies from across the world showing various levels of advantage to the candidates at the top of the ballot paper. There's nothing you can do to prevent that. Somebody needs to be at the top of the ballot paper. Um, but for the principle of fairness, but also the, the perception um, of fairness, um, I think that randomising the ballot papers um, means that there is uh, no way to secure that advantage. I remember one particular incident where a candidate from uh, my party was accused of having changed their surname so that it began with A. Uh, that candidate was successfully elected, um, and I can confirm that they were, uh, yeah, by something in the region of 4%. I can confirm that the candidate was not particularly enthusiastic to have been elected to that particular local authority and most certainly had not changed their surname to secure that advantage. I think if they'd realised that in advance, they maybe perhaps would have kept their previous uh, surname, though their partner might have had something to, to say about that. Um, so because of that unfair advantage, what I'm proposing here is uh, randomisation. Um, I've not prescribed uh, a method of randomisation. Uh, local authority returning officers can simply draw straws, pick names out of a hat. They might want to do it like the uh, cup draw at the football and get minor celebrities in, live stream it, make it a bit more exciting to the, the three people who will be watching. Uh, that's for them. I've simply stated that I believe that the, the ballot papers should be randomised to uh, tackle this issue. So, Jeff obviously, randomisation in the way that um, Mr Greer's mentioning then locks in another disadvantage because there's still somebody at the top. This is an area there's been a fair bit of discussion about and debate about, and it's really difficult to find an answer. So I, w I wonder if it's possible to, for 
Mr Greer should not press his mo mo um, amendment today, but to have a discussion with the Minister about m maybe finding a way that this can be looked at properly. F I, 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 when I had um, Mr Hepburn's um, role in, go in government, this was looked at, and I kind of fell on the side of thinking that the practical solution was having two ballot papers, so A to Z and Z to A, which meant that, you know, if you're in the middle, you're in the middle, but some people were at the top and, and then they were at the bottom of, of half, so it kind of removed. But like Mr Gay, I wouldn't want to be prescriptive. I think this is something that would absolutely have to be taken forward in, in collaboration with uh, COSLA in particular, government colleagues, because I think that's where it has most impact, is, is particularly when there's two members of one party yes. on, on a ballot. I think there it has a, a big issue. So. I think there's an issue here and you know whether we could look at a power so that this could ultimately be taken forward without waiting for another bill but you know so that maybe maybe, maybe there's some a discussion that we can jointly have with um uh, the minister um for a stage three amendment that's great yeah I, i'm grateful to joe fitzpatrick for that intervention i recognize that substantial uh, amount of work that, that he did on this uh, issue when, when it was part of his ministerial role uh, and i'm certainly very open depending on what the the minister's about to say to not pressing it at this stage because i think it's again like some of the other issues we've discussed an important principle a long recognized area of debate that needed aired as, as part of this process uh, and if there is the potential for us to come to agreement uh, or ahead of stage three i'd be more than happy to, to take that approach but at that point, I will wait and hear what the Minister has to say. Grateful to the Member, and I'm going to call Annie Wells. Mm, thanks very much, Convener, and I thank Ross Greer for the amendments that he's put forward. But we've already heard from disability groups as well that randomisation could negatively impact some of, some of those disabled people. So I think, yes, it requires further consultation, I think further discussions about it, but at this moment in time, I would ask Mr Greer not to press the amendment. If he did press it, I couldn't support it at this time. Okay. I'm grateful, Annie Wells. And to the Minister. Thank you, uh, Convener. Mr Greer rightly says there's been a, a long-standing debate on, on these issues. I should say I can well imagine Mr Greer would take far more interest in watching a draw in the order of uh, names in a ballot paper than he would in the Scottish Cup draw, but I, I'll leave that to one side. It is very clear that there are it's strong views among many members and uh, councillors that the alphabetical order of names on ballot papers has uh, disadvantages. This is an issue, as has been touched on, with a, a complex uh, past in terms of its consideration. And I do not think we could suddenly move to randomisation of names on ballot papers for a, a number of reasons, and in particular without prior consultation and engagement, not least with councils and councillors themselves. First and foremost, uh, convener, as Annie Wells uh, made uh, mention of, uh, we must consider the, the concerns that have been raised by some regarding potential negative effects this would have on some voters with accessibility needs, needs particularly those with sight loss. The electoral form consultation that the government ran in 2017 looked at this topic and the possibility of randomisation and other options. Equality groups responded to both that consultation and a study undertaken by the Electoral Commission in 2019 to set out their concerns that randomisation would disadvantage candidates with disabilities. I know the Electoral Commission has written to the committee to make that point uh, as well. In responding to the 2017 consultation, uh, the Scottish Council on Visual Impairment said SEOVI's very strong preference is to retain alphabetic listing of candidates and would urge against moving away from this method. SEOVI acknowledges the concerns about list ordering but considers the ability of people with vision impairments to undertake their democratic right to vote independently and in secret to be a principle that must not be jeopardised. And in closure in Scotland set out, while we would not disagree that counteracting the list order effect is a worthwhile goal, we would urge that any system used for doing so be balanced with the potential complication it adds for the electorate. I recently wrote uh, to the committee updating on ongoing work to improve how voters with sight loss complete their ballot independently and in secret. I believe the ongoing development of tactile ballot paper overlays and the accompanying audio support could potentially be undermined by the randomisation of names on ballot papers. That might be a step backwards for voters with sight loss. It is clear uh, from what we've been told that many voters rely on being able to memorise the order of names in the ballot paper in advance of voting or use the large posters of the ballot paper and polling stations as an aid. I think we would all concede uh, that randomisation would 
add a, a complication to uh, that. Uh, whilst uh, there may be work that can be uh, done uh, to ensure that we would not disadvantage anyone in society, this needs considered before any changes are, are made. Uh, and heard what um, Mr Greer said about consultation and the experience of other places. He mentioned Denmark specifically. I've already mentioned the study the Electoral Commission undertook in 2019. They, uh, from their work, um, said that there was, uh, they could find no impact on uh, the ability of voters to cast uh, their vote. And I should say also, as I said, a note that the amendments also apply to parliamentary uh, elections, whilst the list order affecting local government elections has been often debated and is, I think, understood to a degree by us all. I'm not aware of any issues caused by the order of names on ballot papers in Scottish Parliament elections. I should say I have no skin in the game in that regard because I'm an H, Mr Gree is a G, so um, this is not out of self-interest. The list order effect is generally considered to be a feature in STV elections where one party has multiple candidates standing in the same ward. The government last set out its position on this matter in a letter to uh, this committee on October 2022. This concluded that we had no plans to undertake further research unless and until there is a specific proposition that is practical, accessible and which has attracted cross-party support. No such proposal has been brought to our attention since that time. Otherwise, we might have been able to test such a proposal. What I would be keen to do is engage with Mr Gear between now and Stage 3 to see if we can determine a way to perhaps create an enabling mechanism to be put into the Bill, which would provide us with the time and space to consult on how we might be best address issues of concern around the order of names and council ballot papers, whilst accommodating the concerns that some organisations have flagged. So as such, I would ask he doesn't press his amendment, but should he choose to do so, I would urge committee members not to support the amendments in this group. I'm grateful, Minister. Ross Graves, wind up press or withdrawal amendment 66. Thanks, Commissioner. I'm happy to take up the Minister's offer of further engagement, and therefore I won't be pressing or I'll be withdrawing 66. Ross Greer seeks to withdraw amendment 66. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. There are no objections, so the amendment is withdrawn. Um, call amendment 67 in the name of Ross Greer. Already debated with amendment 66. Ross Greer to move or not move? Not move, Commissioner. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 57. Ross uh, Greer to move or not move? Not move, Convener. I'm grateful. I call Amendments 69 in the name of Ross Greer, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Ross Greer to move Amendment 69 and speak to all of the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm only going to speak to, to my own uh, amendment in this group, and I'll be um, quite brief. So 69 would require parliamentary approval for any pilot uh, that alters how votes are cast. So not all uh, pilots, but specifically any pilot of how votes are actually being cast. Um, and my primary area of concern here is uh, e-voting, electronic voting, digital voting, however you, you wish to, to phrase it. Um, I am not seeking to ban e-voting uh, pilots outright, though in all honesty um, I would. Um, but um, I think that uh, moving from a, a paper ballot to an electronic uh, ballot, even for a pilot, um, is of such significance that I believe it should uh, require um, specific consideration before such a pilot goes ahead. Um, even any a pilot in a trial of a, a new system, even if it was to be in you know, a single area, um, is still going to be trialled as part of a live election where the result is somebody being elected to represent uh, a, a community. Um, so given the, the significance of uh, the long-held concerns that there are about uh, the uh, potential uh, ability to compromise such a, a system, um, I think that there should be that additional level of, of scrutiny and that uh, uh, therefore any pilot that changes how votes are cast should be subject to um, the approval of Parliament. I'm grateful. Minister, can I invite you to speak to Amendment 35 and the other amendments in this group? Certainly. I'll start with um, Mr Greer's uh, Amendment 69, uh, if I may, which, as he's laid out, uh, obviously ensures that any electoral innovation pilot would which would change the method used to cast votes must be approved by affirmative resolution of the Parliament. From the discussion I had uh, with him, and again I was grateful for that before uh, today, and from what he set out today, his concerns relate quite specifically 
to electronic uh, voting. And I do have a concern that the wording proposed might have an impact on some possible pilots where changes to the method of voting uh, maybe don't reach the threshold of concern that I think he has with that specific area and perhaps, for example, are uh, focused on accessibility uh, improvements. Uh, convener, I, I know that those who are not on the committee didn't um, receive these, but I sent uh, samples uh, for the new tactile voting uh, devices uh, that are being piloted, uh, for instance, uh, to, the, to the committee. Uh, and that's uh, an example, I think, where we mm. I could be wrong. The committee might take an alternative view, but I don't uh, think we would probably feel that, that crosses the threshold that would require an affirmative vote of uh, Parliament. So, what I would suggest to Mr Greer, and I should say in, in doing so, I'm not necessarily saying I'll agree with it at stage three, but I would discuss it further with him. If his concern is as narrowly focused uh, as it is, I think he might be better uh, not pressing uh, Amendment 69 today uh, and instead bringing back a more specific amendment on a specific area of concern uh, relating to electronic voting uh, at stage three. So I would urge him to, to consider doing that today. Convener, amendments 35 to 43 respond to the committee's recommendation that the Electoral Commission should be added to the list of bodies to be consulted on proposed election pilots. This means that persons proposing an electoral pilot must consult the Electoral Commission before making such a proposal. Uh, this means that Scottish ministers will be obliged to consult the Electoral Commission as well as the Electoral Management Board before making any modifications to the pilot scheme proposed by a local authority or registration officer under Section 5 of the 2002 Act. Uh, Mr Doris's amendments 4 to 7 would allow the government to make regulations for pilots about electoral registration uh, and set out how such pilots may be proposed and evaluated and made permanent if uh, desirable. Uh, of course, this relates to an area that was recommended by the committee at uh, stage one. I'm grateful to Mr Doris for bringing these amendments. I was pleased to uh, speak with him and work with him uh, in advance of stage two to help uh, develop them. Uh, amendments four and five will uh, allow Scottish ministers to make regulations for temporary pilots and voter registration. Any pilots that are proposed to ministers must first be the subject of consultation with the Electoral Management Board and the Electoral Commission before they can be approved to ensure that the expertise of the electoral community, for want of a better term, has been taken into account. They will be involved in implementing the rollout of any successful pilots. Amendments 6 and 7 ensure that pilots will be fully evaluated by the Electoral Commission. Ministers will be able to seek to make a change permanent through an affirmative instrument, but only if the Electoral Commission have independently made this recommendation in their evaluation report. Information sharing is likely to be a key aspect of any pilot on voter registration. And as uh, is the case, uh, such as the case of automatic registration, Mr. Doris's amendments include provisions to facilitate this. Specifically, Amendment Four includes provision about the processing of information in relation to registration. The government supports these amendments. We are committed to ensuring that everyone who is eligible to vote is able to register and to be able to do so. Complete and accurate electoral registers are an important part of this. And we know that certain groups, such as young people, people in private rented accommodation and foreign nationals, are far less likely to be registered. Piloting innovative forms of voter registration, such as those that make better use of public data, is one way we can seek to improve the electoral registers. Mr Doris's amendment set out a robust procedure to ensure these innovations will be proposed in consultation with those with responsibility for administering elections, piloted on a temporary basis, and fully evaluated before being put to Parliament for a decision whether to make the reforms apply generally and to be made permanent. I urge members to support all amendments in this group, save for Amendment 69, which I ask Mr Greer not to press. Bob Doris, can I welcome you this morning both to the committee and back to the committee and invite you to speak to Amendments 4 and other amendments in the group. Uh, Thank you, Convener. Um, let me start off by saying there may be a degree of uh, duplication and overlap in relation to the Minister's comments, given that, that we work quite closely on this, but I would ask for your indulgence, in Convener. And speaking to my amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7, I want to commend the Committee for its Stage 1 recommendation on automatic voter registration pilots, as well as acknowledging the Electoral Commission's support of such pilots. But I'd also like to thank Councillor 
Alex Kerr from Glasgow City Council. Together we met with the Minister to make the case for automatic voter registration pilots and to seek an assurance that there was a legislative framework, a robust one, that would enable this to happen. These four amendments drafted with government support following our discussions demonstrate strong partnership working and I'm grateful for that for those efforts. Amendment four enables the Scottish ministers to make regulations for temporary provision about the registration of electors in the registers used for both local government and Scottish Parliament elections. The registration pilots are expected to be run by public bodies or bodies with public functions by agreement with those relevant bodies. The amendment also clarifies the regulations cannot affect someone's right to be registered to vote in itself. As pilots are temporary, regulations made under this power must include a date by which they expire. The Minister will only be able to make regulation under this section where a proposal for a pilot has been made and approved in accordance with Amendment 5, to which I now turn. This makes clear that pilots can be proposed by ministers, the Electoral Management Board for Scotland, a local authority, or an elected registration officer, either on their own or jointly by submitting those proposals to Scottish ministers. It also makes clear the consultation requirements that are required to approve those and to modify those proposals. Finally, a registration of electors, pilots, may only be put in place if the provision is considered likely to facilitate registration or encourage more persons to register. Regulations made under this provision must specify a date before which the Electoral Commission must send a report to evaluate the pilot, and the procedure for this section is under a negative process. Amendment 6 deals with the evaluation report. It sets out that the Electoral Commission must prepare a report on the operation of the pilot, send a copy to the report to Scottish ministers, any local authority to which the pilot relates, the Electoral Management Board and any ERO who proposed the pilot in the first place, and publish the report. The amendment also states aspects the report must cover, such as the assessment of success or otherwise of the pilot provisions. Importantly, it must also include an assessment of whether the provision similarly, eh, similar to that may be made in regulation to apply generally or on a permanent basis, moving from a temporary pilot eh, onto permanency, which is the subject of Amendment 7, which provides Scottish ministers with the power to permanently modify electoral law if following the Electoral Commission's report, they decide that the piloted provisions or similar provisions should apply generally and on a permanent basis, contingent on the Electoral Commission's report's recommendation. It also sets out the consultation requirements therein. Uh, together, these amendments provide a clear pathway for public bodies such as Glasgow City Council and others to work in partnership and progress an automatic voter registration pilot. And in closing, convener, I would just note that in 2023, the Electoral Commission estimated that 19 per cent, up to 1 million voters, were either not on an electoral register or registered inaccurately, which put at risk their right to vote. And that is the real policy intent within these amendments. Uh, thank you, Convener. I am very grateful, Bob Doris. I have had no indication of any other members who wish to speak. Uh, Minister, do you have any comments? Uh, no more than I would uh, once again urge Mr Greer to consider <laughs> withdrawing his amendment. Okay. Well, we'll move to uh, Ross Greer to wind up press or withdrawal amendment 69. I'm happy to take up the Minister's offer of engagement ahead of stage three with the caveat that we may end up not uh, seeking agreement anyway, but I'm happy to, to give that a go and therefore uh, not press. I'll, I'll withdraw 69. Ross Greer seeks to withdraw amendment 69. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? There are no objections, so the amendment is withdrawn. I'm going to call amendments 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42 and 43, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I will invite the Minister to move the amendments 35 to 43 on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 35 to 43? Can I invite the member to move amendments 35 to 43 on block? Moved, convener. And are we in agreement with amendments 35 to 43 on block? Yes. We are in agreement. Um, the question is that section 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Grateful. I intend to call amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7, all in the name of Bob Doris and all previously debated. And I intend to invite Bob Doris to move the amendments 4 to 7 on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 4 to 7? And, uh, Bob Doris, can I invite you to move on block amendments 4 to 7? It moved on block, you know. Are we in agreement with amendments 4 to 7? Yes. yes. We are in agreement with that. 
That being the case, we have come to the end of one of the groupings of amendments, and given our time today, I think it would be appropriate to adjourn this meeting at this stage, and we will return next week to complete stage two of the bill. I'm grateful, and I will now close this meeting.